It may only have four strings, but in the right hands, that's more than enough. Who's the best bass player of all time anyway? I have no idea, but in this episode, Eric and I will each pick our top five. Stay with us. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. My name is Dean, and I'm here with Eric. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good. You Yourself, sir. I'm doing well. So what we're doing today is we're going to have a little bit of fun, and we're going to talk about um, our favorite bass players, and we're going to do a top five each um, and and kind of, I guess, make the case for each each of uh, the people on our list to each other. And we'll, we'll just kind of talk about why they're our favorite. Uh, maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you haven't. Hopefully, hopefully it's a little bit of both. Hopefully it's one, it's some that you have heard of and maybe be exposed to ones that you haven't heard of. Um, what we'll also do is uh, you know, I've got some, a, a few songs as, as examples to give, and we'll put links to that in the show notes. So you can just check out them out on YouTube and, and go watch the video. Then at the end, after we've done our top five each, what I did and, and what Eric did is I tried to predict what his top five would be. Mm-hmm. And he tried to predict my top five. See, how, how do you well, think you did? How well do we know each other? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing I, I think at least two, hopefully three, but okay. uh, we'll see. <clears throat> I, I started out with I started out with a strong two and then... Today I had a, a, a an epiphany <laughs> as I was looking at some other research, and and a lightning bolt hit me in the head. So I ran over to the computer and I pulled up my document and I deleted someone and I added someone else. So I, and and I hope I hope it worked out. I, I'll reveal who the who the 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 sixth one I guess at this point would be at the end if it if it doesn't work out. Do you think we have any crossover? Um, I think we have one. We may have one. I think there's, I think there's one guaranteed. Okay. Well, yep. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> so what, what this is, and, and this should be in the thing with, with top fives or when people ask me, what's your favorite movie of all time? Or what's your top 10 favorite bands? It's so conditional on where I'm at, like in my life or what's going on when someone's asking me, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just one of those things that my favorite movie could be one of like any three or four on any given time that someone asks me. So these are not, and that's why it's, it's our top five bass players. It's not the five best of all time because I don't know who that is. Right. And I think that just our top five kind of relieves us of the pressure. Although I'm going to say my number one is going to be my number one. Okay. Do you That's have that fair. too? Or, or you have, you have no particular order? I have no particular order. I actually, well, I, well, actually I do. I, I, I put mine in, uh, from youngest to oldest. As far so as okay. age? As far as age. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. All right. That's, that's interesting. I, I never thought of it that way. So I, we're, um, we're, we're kind of spanning the decades a little bit. I think. Sure. So, that, that's yeah. an interesting way to look at it. Yep. I, I actually mm-hmm. ranged it with my number one, who is was beyond a shadow of a doubt. And then I tried to mess with you a little bit. So I'm, I'm <laughs> going to throw you like a bone for the first one and then maybe confuse you with some of the other ones. So you think you might think, oh, this is going to go a certain way. And then I have, yeah. I have something for you too. So, all right, okay. so let's go. So what we're going to do is we're going to take turns. So Eric is going to go with his number five first. And then I'll do five and f- four, three, two, one, so on and so forth. So let, let's hit it off. Eric, what do you have for your number five? So this would be the youngest? This would be the youngest okay. player on my list. Let's hear it. And the little Missy from Sydney, Australia. Her name is Tal Wilkenfeld. She is a, a force to be reckoned with. I attended... Uh, Eric Clapton's Crossroads Festival back in 2007, and she, um, Jeff Beck, came out and did his set. And on the heels of, of Jeff, as he as he walked onto the stage, there was this very petite girl, just right right behind him, like walking across the stage. And I thought, with this 
beautiful mane of hair. She's got this ridiculous like mane of like long curly hair. And but she looked like she was 14. And I'm thinking maybe she's Jeff's daughter or niece or something. Maybe she's, you know, whatever. Then she comes, she goes over, walks over to the base that's sitting there, puts, picks it up, puts it on. And I'm like, what the hell? What's going on here? The song, they, the, their first song kicked in. I think it was big, big block. And everybody's mouth just was agape. I mean, you look around the crowd and this is a sold out crowd by now. This is like one of the last sets of the day of a 12 hour day. And um, everybody was just floored by her performance in this thing. She, she just, she, she had me gobstapped. I mean, she plays like Jaco Pistorius. She, she is that good. She is phenomenal. And by the end of it, you know, everyone was just going nuts. It, it, she probably had the biggest, one of the biggest responses of the day. And, uh, you know, she started, you know, she took up the guitar at 14 years old. She, you know, she dropped out of high school in, in Sydney at 16, moved to the U.S. Then, you know, from there, she switched from playing guitar to, to bass. She graduated from Los Angeles Academy of Music in 2004, moved to New York City. At 18, she was playing all the jazz clubs and pretty much in the city at that point, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Chick Corea, who sadly passed away uh, just the other day. So rest in peace, Chick. Um, and Herbie Hancock, actually. Now, so the word of mouth was spreading with this with this girl that was just phenomenal. And um, at, one, at one point, she had a, a visit from O'Teal Burbridge, and guitarist Derek Crux from the Allman Brothers Band, they came to see her play because they had heard because they were in town uh, doing their you know their annual residency at the Beacon, and uh, they came to see her play. And they invited her right when her set was done. They invited her to to join them on stage, and so for forty minutes she was jamming with the Allman Brothers, and this was her breakthrough performance. This was the largest stage she had ever been on. For, based on that performance, that's how she got the gig with Jeff Beck because she sent the, a recording of that performance to Jeff because he was looking for a bass player for his upcoming tour and got the gig um, based on that performance with the Allman Brothers. And from there, her, you know, she just skyrocketed. She was playing, you know, Pete with the likes of Jackson Brown. She's played with Prince. She's played with Herbie Hancock. Like I said, she opened for The Who in 2016 while she was writing songs for her her debut album which is not a jazz album it's it's actually her as a singer songwriter and that came out in 2019 and it's called love remains which is amazing the entire album is really good it's kind of a mixed bag of jazz rock folk so check it out guys you know you could probably find it on spotify or any streaming service um but the, the funny thing is about that um she had sent the album because she pretty much completed it in 2016. She had sent it to Pete Townsend of The Who for some weird reason. He responded by saying, you're opening up for us. So she actually got to premiere that album while she was on, you know, opening up for The Who. So she is a phenomenal player. She And again, she, she does play like Jocko. She plays um, very, very strong bass line. She's got very complex ability. And... She's not a bad singer either. I've heard this is the first time I've heard her sing on that album, and she plays guitar. She's got a nice band backing her up. She's got string sections. It's a it's it's a really gratifying thing to see a, someone so young who's got such a reverence for this music that you and I grew up with, pretty much that we love, you know, because she goes back and she, you know, this is pretty much what she does. So, so that's Tal Wilkenfeld. So she, yeah, that's that's my number five. So she's definitely. Check her out on YouTube. You can you can catch some of those performances at Crossroads with Jeff Beck. Um, she she she. You will not be sorry. She's awesome. So number five, huh? Yep. You know what that's called? What's that called? That, that's called a near miss. <laughs> she was number. She was my number six. Okay. <laughs> she was Tal Wilkenfeld was was my number six. Okay. Because I was expo I, I was exposed to her on a Access TV, which is like a music station they show a lot of concerts and they were they kept showing a a jeff beck concert at yeah. 
somewhere. It was like a few years ago and, and Imogene Heap was there and there's a bunch of mm -hmm. other people, but Tal Wilkenfeld was just in the back, just kind of playing. And, and you're right. Her, her playing style reminded me a lot of Jocko and that's what kind of attracted me to it and started paying attention to what she was doing. Right. And the fact that she was holding her own with Jeff Beck, that he trusted, you know, cause you know, with someone like that, he, you got to be just providing the background, but also doing some dynamic stuff too. So um, yeah. And I, so I started kind of following her on Facebook and checking that out and, and, and seeing what she was doing and she's absolutely amazing. So yeah. that's, that's a near miss. She was, she was number, <laughs> uh, she was number, she was absolutely number six, okay. but she, she got knocked off. No. It wasn't, it wasn't because of her age. So, and, and it's funny you mentioned um, Jocko Pastorius because Jocko is my number five. There you go. So, so Jocko Pastorius is a, a jazz bassist, mostly known for his work with Weather Report. Although he did do a bunch of work with Joni Mitchell also when she kind of entered her jazz period, and then he did a he made a bunch of solo albums also. Um, kind of a tortured artist had a lot of issues with um with with drinking and and that kind of stuff getting himself into trouble on purpose died tragically in 1987 mm. i did get to see him and and the funny thing about that is back in the early in the 80s i was taking bass i was taking guitar lessons and then i switched to bass because the the thing is you think oh well the bass has fewer strings so it's going to be easier so the lazy sob that i am i'm like i'm switching from guitar i'm going to take bass because it's going to be easier because i'm just a lazy bastard <laughs> so i switch over to bass and a friend of mine his brother who was actually a friend of mine also so he's a friend of mine um is was a bass player and at the time he was a pretty successful gigging bass player with his band they would play in the city and, and gigs so whenever i'd go over and hang out he was always playing his bass, he always was just figuring music out and just really just doing things. And then one night he says, I came over not with just to hang out. And he goes, you know, uh, we're going to go see Jocko. And I'm like, what's Jocko? Like, what is that? <laughs> I, I didn't know what that was. And back in, back in the eighties, there was a club called the Lone Star Cafe, which was mainly like country music, believe it or not in the city. It was it kind of, kind of, kind of, directed its way towards those type of things like country music and, and stuff like that. But Jocko Pastorius was playing at the Lone Star Cafe. So, and it's a really small place. So we went down there. I wasn't prepared for what I was going to see because I really didn't know what I was getting into. So we, first of all, it was a really weird scene because there wasn't a lot of people there. He, he wasn't very popular. He's not a popular artist in, in that aspect of, mm -hmm. would you know something by him? You, you may, but we went to go see him just like it almost seemed like there was just a bunch of hangers on there at, at the show it was a very small thing, but he was playing and he was doing his own thing. And it, it, it kind of carried with me throughout, although I don't listen to him very often, just the way he plays is amazing. What he was doing with the bass it was, is even more incredible. And, and that kind of when, when I saw Tal Wilkenfeld, it kind of reawakened like, Oh crap, th this reminds me of Pastorius. Mm -hmm. So, I want to give three songs for people to check out. And these, these are like my, if you want to see what he was about, check these out. And, and the, the give me, and I think Eric is going to know this one is Birdland. Yeah. But by, by weather report, right. that's like probably weather reports, most famous song anyway. So mm -hmm. if you've ever heard any jazz fusion or any type of music, you may have heard Birdland. It was actually done as a vocal version by Manhattan transfer, oddly enough, but that one you, you'll probably know. So check out Birdland. That was, um, on the album Heavy Weather, that was from 77. The next two are on a live album he did that I, I picked up at the time. Um, the album was called Invit Invitation, and it was, I believe, it was recorded in Japan because he was really pretty big overseas, bigger than he was in America. Really great live album. Both of these songs are on it. The first one, it's it's America with a K instead of a C, but it's 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 about a minute long, but it's his version of America the Beautiful, and it's just the bass. And he's doing those uh, those kind of false harmonics that he got known for. It's just very soulful playing, and it's just him. So if you really want to hear what, what Jocko was able to do, check out America. And then my fun song by him is a song called The Chicken. <laughs> and it's a really great song. It, and and on, the, on the Invitation album, they have what's called the soul intro, and it's like a big band intro to it. 
And then it, he like with like the horns and the saxophone, it almost reminds me of like the music you hear at the end of an SNL episode, like when the band is like playing out. Yeah. This beginning reminds me of that for some reason. And then it goes into the song, The Chicken, which normally is is kind of bass and guitar oriented. But since he had the horns, he uses the horns to great effect. So great. So Jaco Pastores, and, and again, tragically, you know, he never got to realize, he died when he was like 35. So he never got to really get, get everything under control and, and really kind of become the, now he's like a legend. He's like a Jim Morrison legend, but in, in jazz bass playing. Right. Uh, for whatever that means. So, so there it is. So number, so we got number five, we got Tal Wilkenfeld and the, re, the, the father of that, of that style is Jocko yeah. Pistorius. So number four. Okay. Let's hear it. What do you got? You're never going to guess this. You would never guess this one. This one was completely random and it's actually based on <clears throat> one album. And it's an album that actually I have to give credit to my wife, Kelly, for getting me into. Uh, funnily enough. So uh, the guy's name is Brian Ritchie of Violent Femmes. And their debut album is their best-selling album. Um, but they would go on to make, I think, nine more over a span of a couple of decades. I like quirky. I, I like weird. I, you know, every now and again, I, I enjoy a good sort of odd sound. And this album was labeled as folk punk. And I'm like, what the hell is folk punk? So let me check this out. Okay, it it it, it is. It's 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 hard to describe. It's kind of like, um, almost like an unplugged record because it's very acoustic. But that bass just pops on this record on every song. And if you've ever heard "Blister in the Sun," add it up. I, I have. Yeah. Kiss Off, Gone Daddy Gone is like sort of a reggae tune, but he puts a, a different spin on it with the bass. The bass on this album is what really drew me to it. And I just love it. I love, you know, every now and again, I put it on. And I just, I, I love the entire record. It's just so quirky and so, you know, it is kind of, they, I guess they're trying to be kind of a punk band, but not really. It's more alternative, a little underground, um, but the quirkiness of it. Uh, he would actually, they would actually break up just a couple of albums later. And he, he put out his first solo record called blend in 87, which is, which is kind of odd. You know, this you're in a band and then, then just a couple albums later, you're putting out a solo, a solo album, um, which was, it would probably not be to everyone's taste. It is, it's, it's even more quirky and weird. Um, I, you know, I kind of, I like the violent fence stuff better, but um yeah, I mean this. You know, every every album that they put out, um, they did some different stuff. Of course, they plugged in a few times, but the bass was always consistent. It's fat. He's got a really nice chunky, sort of chunky style. He really knows how to go off. You know, really go off and on, on, on a long, like fast. You know, like blister in the sun. If you you know you listen to the bass line on that, that's a perfect example of what he what he what he what he's all about. Um, He's all, oddly enough, he's also pr very proficient at a another instrument called the shaku hachi, which is a Japanese flute. And he became such a master of that that when he wants now he you know he wants to start training pe other people on it, he had to actually go through this ritual, sort of like an ordained kind of thing of becoming a master to play this thing. That's how you know, referential this thing is. It's like, and, and he's, he's got a, a professional name. Now he's a, he's Tai Raku. And uh, the name of the, the status of, of, of being able to play this thing is, is called the Jun Shihan. <laughs> so he's really proficient with this instrument. Just in, 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 I think he's actually the preferred instrument now over his bass playing. I actually went on YouTube the other day and I saw him playing this thing with bare naked ladies of all people. And he's playing this flute and it's just odd. It's just a really weird, really weird scene. But yeah, but definitely check out uh, that, that first Violent Femmes. It came out in 1983, their debut album. It's their, it, it went platinum. Um, but yeah, all the songs that I mentioned are from that album. And it's just, it's, it's worth a listen, guys, if you haven't heard it. So check it out. So that's Brian Ritchie. That's my number four. Number four. Yes. That's my radio voice. Number four. <laughs> All right. So that's that's two. So he's the second youngest right. going by your list. So mm -hmm. he's 
He's actually a little bit able up there. Able to vote and able to drink. <laughs> and can drive and get cheap and cheap car insurance. Yeah. My number four, this is this is not going to be you, – you, you want to play that game with me? You want to be like, oh, you're not <laughs> guessing this guy? Well, here's mine. And, and you know what? It's funny that our order is like this because we – for everybody, we did not consult. We did not talk about bass nope. players whatsoever. Nope. All we said was, you choose your five, I'll choose mine, and at the end, we'll reveal our picks. My random bass player that you'll never guess for my number four is Nigel Harrison from Blondie. Okay. He is the bass for the classic lineup of Blondie. So, like there the 78 go. to 82. Uh, lineup of Blondie and he's like an unsung hero. Blondie is Debbie Harry for lack of a better term. Meaning she is so enigmatic of that band that that's all, you know, and everybody else might as well be faceless. Maybe Chris Stein, who was her boyfriend at the time and, and like the guitarist and kind of the leader of the band. But for, for the most part, everybody else was kind of faceless, but Nigel Harrison really had it played an important role in in that span, because when he joined Blondie, that's when they got popular. And then when they, when they kind of broke up. So he was in that parallel lines, uh, E to the beat auto American phase. And he, he, his bass playing is so important on, on parallel lines. It was one of the first re parallel lines was one of the first cassettes I bought on my own when it came out. And kind of like, that was like music that became music I listened to. So I really was, even back then when I was a kid, I was just so observant or aware of how tight Blondie was as a band. Like when I yeah. think about it, like when you listen to Parallel Lines, they just are are so in sync and so tight. And and his bass playing is is just a part of that. And I've always – he's such an unsung hero like Nigel Harrison. Who is he? Well, to me, he's he's number four. And, and here's some songs you should check out and this will tell you why. From Parallel Lines, picture this. That's the name of the song. Mm -hmm. amazing bass work from their next album eat to the beat atomic and and that and that's got a really kind of a disco-y uh vibe to it that song atomic and it's and you need that throbbing pumping bass really pushing the song and you really hear it there mm. and then like the tour de force for bass lines you want to guess what it is Uh, Heart of Glass. No. No. Rapture. Rapture. Ah. Oh. The iconic. I almost had it. Almost had it. <laughs> that's, that's the iconic bass I line. agree. Yeah, that is. A and and he, keep, he nails it, nails it, nails it. At, and again, it was at a time when Rapture, yes, and it was the first time like rapping was done, like mm -hmm. by rock arts or whatever it is. But but his his bass playing on that is just so on on point and unrelenting that he does not get enough credit. Everyone gives Debbie Harry the credit, which he deserves. I love Debbie Harry and I love Blondie, but I like, I love him less when he was not in the band. You know, he is such an important part and he's such a driver. And when you see videos, if you see videos of them in concert, he's just like, he's, he's into it. He's moving. He's not flashy, flashy, but he's definitely driving the, driving the, the rhythm section, I think, uh, and, and really in control of it. So it, it's kind of like, he, Blondie is lesser for not having him. And it's a shame that when they got inducted to the Hall of Fame, Blondie, they did not let him play and they did not let Frank Infante play, who was the, those, Frank Infante was the second guitarist during that period also, during that Parallel Lines period. And Blondie had like a new touring group. But you know what? For the, for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the original members of, they're in the audience. They were invited. Yeah. And and absolutely. Frank Infante actually came up on stage when he accepted. He's like, we're, we, you know, I want to play. I'm ready to play with you. Let me play, uh, you know, when they play like their little show afterwards. And Blondie's like, no, we, we have our band. Thank you. So it was such a, such wow. a slap in the face. Yeah. Nigel Harrison wasn't involved in that, but, but he was by association. He wasn't invited to, to play with, with Blondie either. So it's kind of a sad situation, Yeah, but such a great bass player. That's number four. Okay. Number three in the, the age climbing ladder. <laughs> well, we had one from down under. So now we have one from that hails from Toronto, Canada. And you guessed it. This guy is probably in every, almost everybody's top 10. And that's Getty Lee of Rush. Um, 
you know, I'm going to be a little cliche here and say, what can I say about the guy that hasn't already been said? But uh, my first experience with with the band was the 2112 album. I think my brother had bought me that album for my birthday. And uh, I think thinking that because Star Wars had just come out, so he probably figured my brother's going to like this band because it's sort of a sci-fi concept. And, you know, and he was right. I dug it. I, I immediately dug the album, like especially the first side where it's just that whole like tells a story of like a futuristic society that that's against music and this this all this thing. But what, the first thing I, that that I noticed about Getty Lee was his voice. Of course, he has a very unique voice, and especially in the early stuff, it's. It, I would say it's probably an acquired taste. It's a lot of people kind of turn a lot of people off. But, the, you know, some people really dug the octaves that he was able to achieve. Uh, so the bass didn't really grab me right away. His bass playing would come later on, um, on especially on albums like Hemispheres. Uh, La, La Via Stragiato is probably my favorite track off of that, that record. And it's almost like a precursor to uh, YYZ from Moving Pictures, which is another good, really good example. Uh, Red Barchetta, which almost kind of has a, reminds me of a, somewhat of Chris Squire with, with the fish. It has that the really high octave. He's like, you know, bing, ding, 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 you know, playing on, on that kind of thing going on. Uh, and then as we move into the eighties, of course, he would start playing more keyboards and how this guy was able to achieve playing bass to sing like that, to play these really complex, you know, uh, bass lines and play keyboards in the live setting was is beyond me. He he's been called the freak of nature because he's just so proficient at all three. And I think the band even thought about adding a fourth member to kind of lighten the load. Of it. But Getty Lee was adamant and said, "No, we need to remain a trio." You know, because they they're just they were really really tight unit and remained that way for four, over forty years. Um, so. As you know, the keyboard thing started moving in. You, know, you get to stuff like signals and you, uh, songs like subdivisions, which is probably one of my favorite tracks because you know that song is about us. It's a perfect song. The lyrics are about who we were growing up. I was a, I was a nerd. I was a geek. You know, it, it really speaks to me on that level. But I love the bass in that song. It, it really it, it compounds you with the this sort of heavy, you know, eighties thing going on the production but then listen to the bass on the on, on the chorus when you know when you hear subdivisions and then you hear the bass line going it's 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 great um analog kid is another great one with a great bass line the track right after that and then later on i even liked some of the like later stuff in the 80s there's an album that hold your fire which is not probably not one of their best um, because at that point they were kind of considered more of a sort of a synth pop band. They were kind of going in that direction. But I even, I, I love Time Stand Still, the duet he does with Amy Mann, fellow Canadian, fellow bass player from uh, Till Tuesday. And um, I love that song, you know, the lyrics of that song and the bass playing even in that song. And, it, and, and at that point he was playing a more funkier style too. It was almost like a jazzier style which is a, you know a testament to what Rush was all about. They were constantly adapting, constantly changing over 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 the time. Even Neil Peart would reinvent his drumming style after he got he was actually taught by a jazz player and totally reinvented the way he plays drums. So those familiar patterns that you you hear in a lot of their songs was gone in the, in a lot of the later stuff. Um you know, I have to be honest, I mean after sort of the you know the early 90s I kind of sort of stop listening to Rush after a while. So I, I'm not all that familiar with their later stuff, but one album really stands out and that's Snakes and Arrows. And there's a, a really great track on there called Malignant Narcissism. <laughs> and it's, you know, well, just one of those, like it's an instrumental, but again, the bass on that is is just phenomenal. And yeah, I mean, he's just, he, he's definitely probably, I would, I would, I would put him in the category of, of definitely one of the greatest bass players of all time. You know, so that's that's Getty Lee. That's my number three. No, argu no argument there. Yep. YYZ will melt your brain. Yeah. <laughs> the first, yeah. the first, I I remember the I actually remember the first time I heard YYZ. 
you got to go back to like the 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 mid to late 80s 85 86 87 in in the new york area guys driving uh regals mm-hmm. which is a which is a car which they don't make anymore yep. was a big thing guys having alpine st- car stereos was a big thing guys having amps in their car and and s- gigantic speakers like in the back was a big thing so this guy i knew i used to work at a at a pizzeria and uh, he used to work at an electronics store, so so he would get all of his stuff, his Alpine stereos and everything. So we, I went, I was hanging out with him one night, but I was in the back seat, and he he took the uh, speakers in the back in the back to the like umpteenth level. Is I was actually had to sit in the middle of the back seat, and there was actually speakers like speaker cabinets on the seats, and I had my arms like straddling. And he's like, yo, check this song out. And the thing is, he he plays YYZ. And I was like absolutely blown away. But he said, the name of the song, that, that song was called Red Barchetta. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. So I go to, I go to the, you know, the record store, or whatever. I get the cassette of moving pictures because it's got Red, Red Barchetta on it. And that's the song that I'm supposed to be listening to, which blew me away. So I'm listening. I'm like, that's. That's not the song. That's not the song. It's right. like, that's not the song. Well, good. Thank God. YYZ was actually on that. It was like the next song. Yeah. So he was he was off by one. Right. But I still was able to get my brain melted. If you've ever played Guitar Hero on any of the video game things, like people doing YYZ perfectly, playing Guitar Hero is like a it's like God mode for people that try and do it. So <laughs> yeah. I will absolutely advocate for, for Getty Lee and for rush and for that song was just it's it's it as a rush song forget about the bass it, it's it, everything is highlighted the drums are highlighted the guitar is highlighted it, it's just a great piece of music that has its it's everyone gets a chance but then it's got it's got it's got a it's got a a theme to it also there, that they uh, return to they just that riff we talked about uh led zeppelin being just one of those bands that are just consistent. I mean, you just know they're great. You know, even you don't even have to be a fan of bands like Zeppelin necessarily or Rush to to know that these guys are fantastic musicians. You better you know? recognize. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so. Number that was your number 3. That was Getty my number Lee. 3. Fun fact about Geddy Lee, he's a big baseball fan. He collects uh I believe yeah. autographed baseballs and and be- baseball memorabilia, oddly <laughs> yep, enough. Yep. <laughs> straight yeah hey, you know little what? tidbit there <laughs> more power to him right all right so my number three is a session player session player are people that are just do that they are people that get hired to play on records or on on tracks or just individual songs if need be very prevalent back in the 60s and the 70s and of course obviously used today when people need a need a particular type of song or, or style or, or or artist or performer to do it um my number three is probably the greatest session bassist of all time and my number three is carol k and carol k is started out as a a session guitarist. She was a, a guitarist first and she played on like La Bamba by Richie Valens. She she was there at, at those sessions. She was she was playing that. Uh, she was scheduled for a, a session and the bass player didn't show up. So she switched over to bass and she goes, you know what, I can do that. And I can kind of take my talents as a guitarist and, and transpose them. And that set her on to some of the most iconic sessions that she played on. So, I mean, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three and one's, one's a personal favorite and you can kind of, you guys can roll your eyes at it when I give it to you. She was also very famous for working with, with Phil Spector and, and Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. She appears on a lot of Beach Boys albums. Mm -hmm. So when you hear good vibrations and you hear that bass line in the beginning, that's Carol Kay playing that. So and when you hear um, another song like, like the beat goes on from Sonny and Cher, that doom, 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 that's her. That's Carol Kay. She is everywhere. She's on 
River Deep and Mountain High by Ike and Tina Turner. She played with Buffalo Springfield. She played on, on Monkey Sessions. She played with Glenn Campbell. She played with Nancy Sinatra. She's played the Righteous Brothers. She's there. And, and she's really an unsung hero. And and Carol Kay really just I love her playing. She's she's a pick only player. So that's very unique that she that she she picks, but you would never know. She gets such a nice round sound. It doesn't sound like that tinny plink, plink, plink. Mm. Uh especially if you listen to good vibrations, that's her that's her playing with a pick. And she has a really great technique, awesome technique. So I'm gonna recommend good vibrations because that's really iconic. She was on the session for one of my favorite Beach Boys songs of all time anyway, so I'm going to throw that in there is Wouldn't It Be Nice, which is my favorite Beach Boys song probably of all time or as of this recording. So she was on that. And then my goofy go-to is since she was a, a session musician and she was a member of the Wrecking Crew. So if you don't know who the Wrecking Crew is, you can look it up. But the Wrecking Crew was was basically a group of session people that had played – on all these albums, Hal Blaine is was a member of the Wrecking Crew. is one of the greatest drummers of all time, mm -hmm. and Larry Nectol and and Glenn Campbell was a member of the Wrecking Crew also. So all these these musicians were always hired for the same session. So they got to be known as the Wrecking Crew because they would just come in and and just wreck it, right? They would just kill. <laughs> they would give you what you needed, and that's why Brian Not Wilson used it. them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the Beach Boys, the Beach Boys. Well, at, at some point. Brian Wilson started using studio mu musicians for it, for the Beach Boys thing. So he could send the Beach Boys out on tour and use studio musicians to get the sounds he want, wanted and do all the experimenting that he wanted to because he was paying these people. So they were there to be hired. So whatever his crazy ideas were, he just had to get it to them and they would do it. Um, so one of, the, one of the albums that the Wrecking Crew worked on was Whipped Cream by Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. Wow. Before, so the T, Herb Albert had had the Tijuana Brass like uh, whipped cream was was pretty well into the Tijuana Brass discography, but they didn't exist. There was no such thing as as the Tijuana Brass. It was basically Herb Albert would overdub the the trumpets and everything. So when it came to do whipped cream, he used the Wrecking Crew. So he used Hal Blaine and he used Carol Kay and a couple others. And then he started to actually have to get a band together. So then he started hiring musicians that would be the touring band for him. But find the song Whipped Cream. It's on the album Whipped Cream and Other Delights. It's a song you know. It's a great instrumental. It was used on the dating game. If you're of that age back in the day or if you're a kid and you remember it, you will know this song. It's an instrumental. And Carol Kay is such an unsung, influential hero of not only bass playing, but of session music and of impact uh, of the of the songs that she played on in the 60s. She was firmly entrenched in the sound of the 60s. And and if you go look her up, you'll just see the the amazing sessions she was on. It's just insane yeah. the amount of work she was doing and and how prolific she was, and how great she was. She just wasn't like okay, you know. Uh, Good Vibrations is an iconic song and it's got an iconic bass line and and that's her doing it. And if Brian, if it's good enough for Brian Wilson, well, you know, who am I to argue with that? Who was a bass so, player himself? Yeah, right. Yeah, and and she's and just out there. And it's a testament too. She's one of the first women bass players, and for for her to be so, you know, so in tune with what she was doing, and you know, so she was a big boon for a lot of women that came, you know, after, including yeah. Tal, and you know, so. But I'm sure she, you know, she's you got to give credit where credit's due. So yeah, yeah and, and when you're a, <clears throat> when you're a session player, I mean, that's all you're doing. You, yeah. you could be doing <clears throat> sessions all day, so you're really doing nothing but playing. So you either you either sink or swim. You develop the the chops, the the technique, the and and the reputation as being someone who could be relied on too. That can get the music, read it, and perform it, and and deliver it the way it needs to get done. That that's how you make your that's how you make your name also. Yeah. So Carol K. Carol K. Three. Number three. And, and just a quick tidbit uh, of Carol K. Trivia is there was a, a Beach Boys song, one of my favorites also. It's on uh, Beach Boys Today, I think it's called. Um, and it was, it's, the song is uh, The Little Girl I Used, The Little Girl I Used to Know. Mm -hmm. No, The Little Girl I Once Knew, I'm sorry. She's not The Little Girl I Once Knew. The working title was Carol K. Nice. Like the, like the kind of the whole, the placeholder title was called, was Carol K. 
uh, which is a nice tribute. Yeah, Obviously, they sure. can call it that, but yeah. um, that's that's kind of neat that Brian was thinking. Yeah, let's just we'll call it Carol Kay. So I'm sure she pro- probably played a significant role in in that song too. Cool. On to number four. Number so two. this is the second oldest of your bass players. So we're getting up there because Getty Lee is uh, in his 60s easily because he was really from, yeah. you know, mainly from Six, the 70s. He's actually 67. Yeah. So, 67. All right. So is the next one. So this is number 68 two. 68 or 69 actually. or is this one in the 70s? Number he's four. Actually, he's actually, he's 70 years old. 70 point. years old. Number four. Let's hear it. Okay. So he's another session player. Um, he's played on well over 500 albums since the early seventies. Um, his name is Tony Levin. Um, primarily he, he, you know, uh, his main sort of like the longest thing he ever had, you know, uh, was involved with was being in Peter Gabriel's band ever since Gabriel went solo after leaving Genesis. He joined his band in 77 but he's played on some pretty prolific albums like Paul Simon's uh, Still Crazy After All These Years. He played on uh, Double Fantasy with John Lennon, played with Stevie Nicks. He played with Pink Floyd. He played with Lou Reed. And the list goes on. I mean, he's just a really phenomenal player. Uh, pretty, I, I would say he's pretty underrated on, 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 on polls and lists and that kind of thing. But he's got a very unique style. He's all about texture. He's all about uh, craft, just building bass lines that are interesting. They're not necessarily flowing bass lines. They don't, you know, there's, you know, not a lot of fancy, I mean, he does, but it's, to me, it's more from a craft standpoint. Um, He started out playing double bass at the age of 10. Um, He he went to the uh, Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, and studied with drummer Steve Gadd. They actually came up together. And their, fir- their very first recording was an album called Diana in the Autumn Wind by Gap Mangione, um, along with, with Gadd. And on that album, Chuck Mangione played on that record. He did wrote a lot of the songs. If you know Chuck Mangione, he was a, uh, a jazz uh, trumpeter. And like he had some hits in the, in the seventies. Um, but yeah, he joined, you know, Peter Gabriel's band in 1977 and pretty much played on every Peter Gabriel solo album since. So he's, this is probably like the longest stint that he ever had with any one artist, but he also played with King Crimson when they changed their lineup in the early eighties, there was a trio of albums that came out. Uh, there was an album called discipline beat and three of a perfect pair. And he was part of that lineup with Bill Bruford, Adrian Ballou, and Robert Fripp. Um, and to critical acclaim, um, I actually saw them with, with that's the time I saw Tony Levin play in, in that lineup at the, the pier down in New York city, loud, obnoxious, just noise. It was weird. It was, it was crazy, but he had a lot of energy. You know, Tony, watching this guy, you watch him and he's moving on the, on the stage. He's bopping up and down. He's, you know, doing his thing. Um, So that, you know, he was fun to look and he's and, you know, he's bald. He's always been bald. I don't know why that that's a thing, but, you know, I'm bald now. So I kind of relate. <laughs> um, Copycat. Yep. Yep. <laughs> he actually popularized this thing called uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called the Chapman stick. Mm-hmm. Okay, it was invented by um, Emmett Chapman in the early '70s, but uh, Tony Levin really loved this instrument. He actually used it to such a degree that he it, it became he's one of the most famous players to use this, this, this stick. And it's kind of a it kind of looks like a the neck of a guitar or a bass, but a little bit wider. And it's usually it has ten to twelve strings on it, and you could play bass lines you could play melodic lines you could play chord structures texture somewhat simultaneously on this thing so you get all these weird sort of like octaves and and things so he you know he would use that a lot with with gabriel and a lot of his work he also invented something called the funk fingers which is really odd it, what it, what that is is like it's um modified drumsticks they were kind of cut in half and you wear them. He wear you wear them on your fingers with these little tabs like stuck to the ends. 
And what you do is you, 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 you're basically tapping the bass strings with this thing. So you're getting this weird sort of like crunchy tone and this, you know, crunchy sound out of it. So it's like almost like not like slapping the bass. You know, you, you got that famous like mm button mm button kind of thing. This is more sort of a more textured sound and kind of, you know, and you would hear that in, 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 in really a uh, big degree on uh, Peter Gabriel's album. So, and I would cite this album as the, as my example for Tony Levin's work, because his work alone on this album is um, like I talked before about craft. I mean, he built that, you, you check out uh, songs like big time. And that's the, that's when he premiered the funk fingers thing. So that he is actually playing with those funk fingers on the song big time. But of course the first three tracks on red rain sledgehammer, and especially don't give up, which is my favorite. Uh, the, the bass on that song is just, and it's not, this is not a fast song. This is not a funky song. This isn't sledgehammer. This is a, a slow sort of nice little ballad type song with Kate Bush. But the, 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 the amount of, of, of texturing that he overlaid multiple bass parts on this thing fretless with, you know, these, and, and just the, the weird sort of vibe that you get from it. I just love the mood of the song and he, and Tony Levin's a big part of that. So he's, you know, he's still around, he's still playing in, in, a, in a lot of, he's in a, a couple of bands now called liquid tension experiment and a band called stick men where my, you know, it, where these guys are all playing the Chapman stick. It's like three or four guys, like it's almost like a barbershop quartet kind of thing going on where they're, they're doing like this thing, harmonizing with the Chapman stick. So it's kind of, kind of odd, but again, I, I, i like that. I like odd. I like quirky, but this guy, you know, but definitely check out uh, Peter Gabriel's, well, any of his work, uh, any of his albums, but especially so uh, that that's my prime example for Tony Levin's work. So yeah, he, he's, he really he's kind of known for his yeah. like spidery. Yeah playing style kind of like hunt like not hunched over the bass but kind of like yeah he's, he's like oh he's kind of over the bass a little bit and and he's it's got a he's got a very distinctive way of playing he doesn't he's not like just kind of hanging out on his bass he's definitely ma manipulating it and and yeah. using it and and kind of yeah you know, you, when you see him you'll know so you can you can easily go on youtube and, and get one of the peter gabriel concerts mm -hmm. Uh, and, and see Tony Levin, and, and you'll kind of know what we mean. He's kind of like sp spidery and ah, uh, fingers just... fingers curled over the bass, kind of a thing, and and really his fingers stretched out wide on the bass. He's not like a, a bass player that kind of plucks one note and, and moves it around. He he's got his fingers stretched out, and he's really a, across all the frets. He's just really well, like like, really like I said, technique. he's he's mo he's more about texture yeah. above all else, and then you know just putting out a real groovy kind of baseline. He's all about creating those, those tones and, and real, but yeah, you're right. You know, when he's on stage, he's kind of jumping up and down. He's a real skinny dude too. So he's like, so yeah, he's wearing like this long white coat and he's over there like, you know, it's just it's, it's an odd thing. And he has like a, a mustache too for most of the time. Uh, lately he's, he, you know, he carries a goatee, but most of the time he always had this sort of almost like, porn star type mustache. <laughs> so this thing, you know, so he, he's an odd looking fellow, but he's just, but he's really cool. I, 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 as far as session work and, and, you know, just came to know him through Peter Gabriel. He also played on Robbie Robertson's first solo record. Um, so yeah, definitely check out some of that, that stuff and definitely check out. So, which I don't want to go too much into because that's an album, but I'd like to tackle in future in a future episode that's definitely an well, album I, worth, and that's an iconic album you know, from peter gabriel yeah. i mean that was yeah. like his that was his breakthrough and when he really just kind of entered the 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 consciousness of music and people didn't realize that oh he was with another band he was with genesis because at that point genesis was phil collins so again story for another day right but that is uh tony levin that's Absolutely. tony levin so tony, my number two tony levin's your number two and uh and he's what? 70 what? He's 70. 70. So yep. your number one is going to be like 85 or 90. <laughs> so I got I to gotta look up really quick on Wikipedia, like old bass players. Well, and maybe I'll have a shot at at hitting at who it is. Yeah. Well. So my number my number two is a, a personal favorite. And, and it's going to kind of um, – I usually keep this kind of stuff to myself because uh, I just don't like to let it kind of jade anything. 
But my number two is uh, Kelly Graucut from the Electric Light Orchestra. And he's the bass player. He was the bass player up until the mid 80s. He joined actually in 75. So if you're an ELO fan, his first album was Face the Music. He came on after El Dorado. And his last his last album was Some Work in Secret Messages, although he was kind of out of the band by then. Mm-hmm. If you're an ELO with how iconic Jeff Lynn is, it is very hard or it's very easy to get caught up in the in the wash, especially knowing what we know now about back then you kind of think of ELO as a group. And I used to think of it as oh, everybody was kind of equal partners and this was like a group like Foreigner or like Aerosmith or anything like that. Well, not really. ELO was Jeff Lynne's band. He, you know, and he wrote everything. He produced everything. He arranged it. This was his vision. So it's not easy to be in a band like that where you don't have a lot of, of that control or that personal input. But he was vital to what ELO was. He He provided... The the second voice vocally, we're not yes. talking about the bass yet, but vocally he provided the second voice to Jeff Lynn, and it was the perfect blend. Uh, it, all the iconic hits are are with Kelly Graucut kind of ghosting Jeff Lynn or singing singing harmony with him. You know, shine a little love, anything from out of the blue, turn to stone, Mister Blue Sky. Kelly, that, that's Kelly Graucut in there also, and and you almost take it for granted. And, and you don't realize that, oh, the, it, it was someone else. It wasn't just all Jeff Lynn. As far as the bass playing goes, there is a difference. After Kelly Graucut left and when Jeff Lynn took over all the duties, now nothing against Jeff Lynn as a bass player, but he was not Kelly Graucut. Kelly Graucut brought totally something different. The bass lines were moving. They were active. They were really it, – it, in support of the song in a, in a different way than Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynn uses those instruments to a lesser extent, kind of just to kind of root the song. Like bass, bass work now is kind of like, okay, we're just going to play along with the chords. Mm-hmm. But the three songs I've got that are going to blow your mind is – and I'm going to go in order. And this is from like the holy trilogy of ELO. These, these are like the three albums. This is like the Star Wars trilogy. This is like the Indiana Jones trilogy. <laughs> It's not like Jaws because Jaws 3 sucked and then there was another one anyway. So it's not like that. But any three movie cycle, this is it. A New World Record was was their first like in, in in the Holy Trilogy, Out of the Blue and then Discovery. Those three albums really kind of define the the peak impact of ELO. Not nothing against any of the other ones because I love some of the other ones even more. But this was it. This was their their run up. Out of the Blue was like their apex, and Discovery was kind of like starting to come down. So the first song is called So Fine, and it's actually an instrument. It's not an instrument. It's an instrumental a little bit. It's It's got a lot of lyrics to it, but it's got a lot of instrumental break to it. Mm-hmm. So it's a really neat song. It's a really – it's one of those songs. It's a, it's a summer day song. It's a it's an in-the-car song. And Kelly just, just – you Jeff Lynne needed these people – to, to help get his vision there. And I think that Kelly's bass playing on So Fine is, is a highlight and it's a standout and it's absolutely one of the highlights of, of a New World record. Second is from Out of the Blue. See, I'm going in order. So this way I'm kind of leading you down the Kelly Graucut path. So second is from Out of the Blue and it's a song called Starlight. You have to listen to it with headphones on. I implore anybody that's going to even, if you're going to try and listen to this song, you have to listen to it with headphones just because of the production, just because of, of the, you know, the, the, the drifting or panning back and forth between the right and left hand side of, of just the other music, nothing to do with the bass, but the bass on this is just, his bass work is just so beautiful on this. It's such a great ELO song. It's one of a more minimal songs that's on the album as far as production. It's very simple. And it's 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 got great vocal work from him too. He's got great backing vocals yeah, on this. He's got but a great voice. Yeah, it's just a he was so important to to ELO that people really don't understand what he brought. He brought the filling out of of Jeff Lynn's vocals and that mm-hmm. just that extra oomph that it needed that you didn't realize was there. And and his bass playing on on Starlight is just there. So the the third song, which will be from the the Return of the Jedi of this trilogy 
<laughs> is uh, from Discovery, and it's pretty much their biggest hit is Shine a Little Love. And what a what a baseline on this. He he is just this was kind of came out at, at right in the middle of or towards the end of like the disco era. So everyone calls this a you know a disco ELO album, and it definitely has those feelings to it and those sensibilities. And whenever you have that, much like Nigel Harrison, right, with with Rapture, if you're gonna go that route, you need someone who can drive the rhythm. You need someone who's gonna be like steady on. They can't just be plucking the same thing over and over. Shine a little love is is that song for ELO. It's it's really just Kelly moving up and down the bass, and and just a great a great riff that he plays, and he just he's just so so rock steady that he's he's like one of my favorites. And you know what? Fun fact: we share the same birthday, so that's like another thing that I love about Kelly. He left ELO. He he decided to like kind of sue ELO. He's like, you know, I'm kind of getting paid like a side man. And Jeff Lynne's like, well, you are like a side man. You didn't yeah. realize that. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, the, things didn't work out. They did settle, but um, Kelly, w- ELO would break up. They would reform as ELO part two without Jeff Lynne. Kelly Graucott would naturally be invited to do that. He did put out a solo album, which is it really underrated. It's very much, it's it's stuff he's writing, but it, he could have been a form formidable songwriter for ELO with the stuff that's on his solo album. It's very much, he was very much writing in that, in that vein. And, and in that, he was really in that lane of, of what ELO was doing. So he was pretty formidable and he did sadly pass away also. Yeah. So it, it would have been, it would have been nice if when ELO got inducted, if, if he was there and maybe they could, they could have mend some fences, but uh, Kelly Graucott, ELO, my number two. Number two. Yeah. Just, you know, <clears throat> going back, I mean, there's some, those three songs are great. So fine. I love it's, it evokes for me, um, <clears throat> the seventies. You know, when I hear that song, it, it's just, it speaks the seventies in volumes to me. Um, <clears throat> but I, I kind of like some of the songs that he, he actually took on some of the lead vocals with, you know, you think of, uh, above the clouds, which was a nice, nice, it's a very short song, but he, he handles most of the lead vocals on that one. Um, Sweet is the night off of out of blue. I love as well. I mean, he had a very distinct voice. He was a little bit higher than Jeff Lynn. So he, he, they, when they harmonized, it was the, you had that perfect blend. You had those octaves, you know, the high end and Jeff's sort of, you know, mid range. So yeah, it's a shame that you know, it, they they weren't really treated like equals as, in a sense. You know, because to me, that's that was ELO. That was that band was yep. was Jeff Lynn, You know, Kelly Grauka, Bev Bevan on drums, um, Richard Tandy on keyboards. That to me was e- Electric Light Orchestra. Um, you know, despite the fact that Jeff wrote all the songs and he was the you know the producer and all that, but yeah, it's just a shame that they it it just didn't things didn't work out in that sense, you know, and when he left the band in 83, was it secret messages, right? He, that, at that, after that point. Yeah. In, in the kind of in the middle. So he was on some of the stuff and then some yeah. of it was replaced. So it's kind of, it, it's yeah. not a good situation, but it, it definitely changed. The dynamic definitely changed. Cause then Jeff Lynn was doing all of the backing vocals, which again is great because there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Right. But that little, just that that little difference, and, and it sounded very much like it. You know, if you if you asked somebody, they might be, not be able to tell you that Kelly Graucott wasn't on it. I don't know if that's a testament to Kelly Graucott's being able to blend in and, and deliver, or if that's a testament to Jeff Lynn being able to really duplicate it and duplicate understand, it. understand yeah. what Kelly brought and being able to sure. say, "This is what I need," so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of deliver that. Right. So it's 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 yeah, he's really. Another one of my uh, all of my all of my picture like unsung heroes in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everybody's like a like an underdog for some reason, and they're really oh, not. They're you know they're you iconic, know, but yeah, it's me too. I mean, like I, you know, it's it's you know it's what you've been exposed to too. You know, you grow, you, you think you like an artist, but for me, a lot of like getting into like someone like Peter Gabriel or, or something, and and just getting to know who played on these albums. It's that, that was a big thing for me too. Who played on this album? Like what was some of the session musicians, you know, that, that, that to me, it's a, it's, it's a little bit more fun to get to know people that way when you're dealing with a single artist rather than a band situation, you know, so you, you, there's multiple session players on, on any given album. 
you get to that's the journey. That's the journey. Names just you know, they start flowing in your mind, and you wreck it. Oh, he played on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out. You know, so that was the case for me with 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 Levin. So um, yeah, that, right. that's the mu- that's the musical education right there. Yeah, absolutely. Is when you start. Yeah. When you when you open up the album or open up the cassette and you and you pop it in and you listen to it for whatever reason you bought it, mm-hmm. and then you take the 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 little card out of the cassette and you unfold it and you look at the lyrics or who wrote this and then you look at the credits and who was on it. Right. You 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 kind of start to kind of especially when you're young at that age, all that stuff just kind of gets absorbed. Mm-hmm. Like it's not it's not totally important information, but it is when you, if you're getting into something like that and, and it's sure. something you like. Yep. Yeah, you're right. You start to kind of pay attention to those names. And then if you're looking at, at another another album or or the back of something and you see that that person's on it and you start making these connections and it, and it leads you to some maybe listening to a, a different artist because maybe if they are a session person or yeah. or someone that moves around a lot through different genres, they, they may end up with different artists and you get exposed because you kind of like what they did on one album. So yeah, I'll, I'll you know what? I'll take a flyer on this one. And, mm-hmm. I'll, and I'll check it out and see. And then you get it. And even if you don't like it, you're, at least you're kind of getting exposed to it. Yep. So num- number one. So while you were while you were going over yours, I did a I did a quick Wikipedia search, and I think I know who your number one is. It's it's Rip Van Winkle. That's the oldest person I could find. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure if he still plays bass. But uh, I, I, I'm 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 gonna lay odds. He's not on my list. But since you were giving me this other information, I'm I'm gonna go with like Rip Van Winkle. I I don't think he's playing no. much of anything these no. days. All right. So still sleeping. <laughs> still he's still asleep. That's why yeah, I wake him up pretty much. So, so my, we, don't, my, we don't have a drum roll to do it. But th- so is this your is your is this your number one? Like you said, by age. It's by age. And I guess maybe we'll get that too. But, but does this number one happen to be your number one despite age order? Um, or is there not one? I don't think I have a favorite. Okay. I, I really, I, I just don't, I, it's hard for me to rate people. I just, sure. you know, it's like, like you say, it's part of the journey. You know, there are times when you think, oh my God, this guy's the best. And then somebody else comes along and it just, you like him for different reasons. Right. I mean, it's, you know, in this case, he was my f- probably the first bass player that I noticed at, at a very, very young age. All right, let's do it. Number, number one. one is John Entwistle of The Who, um, who sadly is no longer with us. He would have been the oldest. <laughs> but he's, <laughs> Wait a second. So he, he wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> now, now there's a no, that, that's not okay. We need to take we need to take a diversion here. Okay. Are you telling me that if someone passes away, they still continue to age? Well, it's always a thing, right? Like the, oh, like he would have been. Like the, it's not like people vision, still, it's not like the vision from still, the Avengers. Well, people still celebrate birthdays even even after they're gone, right? Oh, he would have been eighty, or he would have okay. been, you know. So that's right. kind of where I, I was going with. So, I, I didn't know. Yeah, see, I didn't know that there was that caveat of death. <laughs> continues continues the aging if i had known that you were counting like someone that passed away and then what their age would have been i i might have thought about something differently but you know i figured okay if someone passes away when they're this age well then that's what they were and that's how old they are and that's where they would go on the list but uh, but i digress okay take it away for 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 so Mr. my Ed first Whistle. experience um was well the who were one of my first Probably the first rock and roll, true rock and roll band that I got into. I mean, just raw, you know, I was exposed to them really early on. And of course, you cannot notice the bass. I mean, that that was the one of the first things because John Entwistle's style was he played a lot of lead. Um, Pete Townsend would actually take a, a back seat to some of his playing, playing a lot of rhythm, which from what I from what I understand, uh, some people have no, uh, pointed out that Pete Townsend might have been the inventor of the power chord as a result of just being playing rhythm, but but loudly. So the power chord was 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 born from you know just from that, and you know, their stage presence was su- was such that they were considered. He was considered one of, like the loudest player, bass player ever. I don't know if he still holds that distinction. <laughs> um, Certainly they're, you know, heavy metal bands and such that, you know, but I don't think he, he created his own little 
mini city of martial amps, like stacking one, one, one amp on top of another, putting, you know, feeds on, on the frets of his bass. It was so loud and you cannot mistake, you know, the, the power that he played. He was known as Thunderfingers. Uh, he was also known as the Ox. Uh, he, the Quiet One was another name, nickname for him. Um, but you can you just can't listen to any of the Who's music without really recognizing. He was the sort of the, the rock for me, the anchor of that band. When when the, when things got really chaotic within the band, you know, when P- Keith Moon was just going off on doing his thing, and you know, I never really got into the whole like smashing the instruments thing about him. John Entwistle was the only one that was standing there still playing and the rest of the band is like smashing. I'd, I'd never understood that. So I never really got into sort of the whole punk attitude kind of thing. The anger, it, it just, to me, it was like a, it was like a circus act, you know, but Entwistle was always the anchor and he was always the one that, that drove a lot of those songs. And if you listen to a lot of the early hits, um, the singles, I would urge people to listen to them, to, to visit those songs, but listen to them in mono. Because in mono, you really get a sense of his bass playing because it was because the bass was turned up so loud that you really get that bottom end on, on those really tinny, you know, songs like I Can't Explain, Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere. Uh, of course, My Generation with that, you know, little bass solo in the middle. So those, you know, if you're going to check out any of the, the Who's early work, check out the mono versions of those albums because they're, you, re, you know, if you're really interested in what Ant Whistle was all about. But my favorite track... Um, is off of Quadrophenia, and it's the real me. It's one of the opening tracks. You know, it starts off with this sort of ambient noise going on, and then it, you know, it 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 just comes right into this really fast like bass riff, and it's like he carries that song. Him and Keith Moon, Townsend's you can barely. I mean, Townsend's hardly on the song at all. In fact, the middle of the song, the the bridge, it's just bass, drums, and Daltrey. That's it. You don't hear anything else. And it's amazing. That I love that, that middle piece of, of that song. And then it just, the whole thing just kicks in with the, with the horns. And by the way, any, any brass that you ever hear on any of their songs, that's Ed Whistle as well. He was classically trained with trumpet, French horn. He's like the only classically trained musician in the who, <laughs> you know, he, he got any kind of formal training. So he, you know, he learned how to play horns and he actually pieced all those horns together to create a sort of a brass section on that album. So all the brass you hear is played by Ed Whistle. It's not, it's not a hired, you know, horn section that came in and played on that record. Um, but yeah, that, that, that would be my ultimate example of, of what Ed Whistle's all. And then he also wrote quite, he also wrote quite a few songs with the band. He would sing some of them. He wanted to sing all of the songs that he wrote. But I, I guess he got outvoted. Townsend and Daltrey Bor- wouldn't would let that be, him. Would that be Boris the Spider? Boris the Spider. <laughs> he, he did Success Story. Uh, My Wife off of Who's Next was that, that was a a, a fan, fan favorite, like especially in live shows. It sounds, he, it sounds like you. It sounds like you were more into the early his earlier work than like Baba O'Reilly or that kind of stuff. Is that well? I mean, there, there's a lot more to digest. Early, you know, in the early work. Too. So Quadrophenia was probably the last great album they put out, and that was 73. So that was after Who's Next. But yeah, the, I mean, th- there's no mistaking Who's Next. You know, that's a phenomenal album in itself. But but yeah, a lot of the early, early stuff I really dug. That's how I really got into The Who, you know, when they were like the high numbers with Zoot Suit and I'm the Face. And, and then they became The Who and they did, you know, I love songs like I Can't Explain in any way, anyhow, anywhere. Um, then they put out an album called uh, "The Who Sell Out," which they, they, you know, they wrote all these like little jingles on the record, There's a, like they sort of like little commercials in between songs, like "Road to Sound Strings." They do with "I Can't I Can't See for Miles," you know. So that's a, that, that's another great one with with, with uh, some nice bass on that uh, in the mono version. Um, but later on i mean you know i think the last album that he played on was it's hard in 1982 that was the last album studio eminence album. front eminence front eminence check front. out the check out the bass on I'm that song i'm telling you yeah that 
that that they used to play that video on MTV yep. heavy. And for the Who at that point, who was kind of they were kind of, you know, it was it was the Kenny Jones era, mm-hmm. and they were trying they were trying to embrace the times. And I love I like that 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 album. There's nothing wrong with that album. So it's kind of and, and it was very. It kind of exposed the Who to a, a younger generation or people that hadn't seen it, and and they weren't trying to do the the big stuff like like Who Are You? They were they were embracing more of that technical and that electronic sound that you were starting to hear. They yeah. didn't go full they Gino Vanelli. They were adapting. They were adapting. Yeah, but to they, the they, adapted, right. they adapted pretty good. I mean, Eminence Front's a great song. I love that. And of yeah, course, and, and then that bass in that song, you think you know, at first it's just doom, but but man. That one note, it's like boom, it's it's like it's there. It's 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 you know that's the bottom. I also love off of Face Dances, um, the quiet one, which is arguably the best song, on the, and that's the song that he wrote. And and it's just a really good rock and tune. And there's a lot of written, nice bass in that. Um, the bass on Another Tricky Day, I love too. It's like this do 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 do, and it's just that's a great that's a great track too. I often think about that in a if I were ever to make a movie about, you know, the early eighties, like, you know, some sort of, so the, that would def, that song would definitely be in the soundtrack, even in possibly even in the opening credits. Wow. Cause I, I love, I love that track so much. It's just, I just love the lyrics and, and you know, that album was not sh- the, the, their strongest effort, but, um, but I dug a lot of the song. They had some nice grooves on that record too. Um, but yeah, sadly that would be the last, album that he would play on and then of course you know the who went on to kind of i kind of fell out of favor with them because they pretty much became it it became more of a cash cow thing where they just kept touring sort of you know sitting back on their laurels and they weren't really putting out any new material um and then of course that's commonly what happens with those bands on like the stones a fleetwood mac yeah but at least they kind kind of reach a point they're still putting out material though in this case the who wouldn't put out an album until until after john entwistle died in, in 2002 yeah that's uh, a long that's like 20 years later i mean that's, that's a stretch yeah absolutely. You know, and then th- what have they done since then right i mean so, they put out they put out two albums but it's not to me that's not really the who yeah. it's just townsend and daltrey with a, with an army of musicians behind them they're touring this thing and they're calling themselves the who and i just when when did entwistle pass away 2002 he was he died in las vegas he okay was, so i did uh, so because i saw them on the yeah the, was it the 25th anniversary of tommy mm-hmm. tour so he was then he was definitely there so that and, was like that was around 97 no put, no the late 90s sure yeah no i don't think so i thought i thought i saw them earlier maybe it was a different Maybe that could have been a different then. show, but I but know it was they great put because it was like a greatest hits. I mean, you know, you go, you go to see a Who show, and you're, you're gonna you're you're not gonna be disappointed. I mean, you're gonna leave, and and you're gonna hear every, every. They're one of the groups that kind of you're gonna hear everything you think you're gonna hear and right. want to hear, and yeah. and you know, Daltrey can still deliver, and you know, I mean, his face oh, yeah. is a little yeah. weird, but. <laughs> but you know, his voice is there. So as long as you don't look at the screen, you close your eyes, you can you can enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> all right but that's but so that's, that's my number one he, that's um, your he number was, one like i said John. he's not he's not my favorite bass player but he was the first the first time i noticed the bass let's put it that way that i actually you know right away he was the f- first instrument i heard was the bass with the with the who so all righty there it is so here we go what's your here we go number one my number one not rip van winkle I can tell you that much. Um, my number one is James Paul McCartney. There we go. Better known as Paul McCartney. And he is my number one. I am going to advocate why he is probably the best bass player of all time. Go and for it. The it, It's pretty simple. I don't think you're going to disagree. I mean, even if, you know, if you want to play the bad guy, you can. I don't think you can, though. I don't think you're, I don't think you're, I don't know if you're up to the part of going against Paul McCartney. I, I think you like him too much also to even try and like be the, oh, absolutely be the, be the doubter. So I don't, I don't <laughs> think it's going to be very, if, if I said, Hey, can you just give me reasons why not? I don't think you'd be able to kind of come oh, there's up no with something. Denying. Yeah, no, I, I don't difficult. deny it at all. I, I will not go against you on this. Paul, Paul McCartney, what he, it, it, it's so easy 
again, it's so easy to dismiss him. And he's a he's a, a mega millionaire, billionaire, everything that he's done. But people still drag him and and still just make fun of him. And they don't realize what, what he did at, at the time he did and what he did throughout the 70s also. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the Beatles. Oh, sure. Wings. What he did with the Beatles was so important because kind of like Carol Kay, who Carol Kay was a guitar player and she switched over to bass, that means something. Back in those days, we're not, I'm not going to talk about jazz musicians because whatever was going on with the bass then is, is a different thing. We're going to talk about rock music. Mm -hmm. For the most part, for the most part, Rock music bass players were kind of like kind of like Entwistle, or you can name any other band. It was a it was always a, a nameless, faceless guy in the back, not really considered part of the band. Even if they were, it was like the bass player was would always be standing in the back with the with the with the drummer, and then the you know if you had two lead guitarists or singer or you know keyboards, they would be up front. So the bass player was always relegated to like a secondary role. In the Beatles, in the original lineup of the Beatles, there was three guitarists. It was John Lennon, George Harrison, and Paul McCartney, and they had Stuart Sutcliffe as the bass player, and he wasn't very good. And then they had Pete Best before their whole Ringo Starr thing. Stuart Sutcliffe really wasn't a bass player whatsoever. He was kind of in the band more as like a fashion thing, and it was cool. It was hip. It was bohemian. Yeah. And he would kind of face, face the drummer because he really couldn't play. So he... He ended up passing away. They they needed a bass player. So Paul McCartney in probably was one of the most, you know, uh important moments in rock history, probably, switches over to the bass. And what he brought was the guitar player's sensibility to an instrument that was normally just known in rock music as Playing with the playing with the drum and playing like whatever the root and and fifth or octave of of whatever chord was going on. Right. For the most part, I'm I'm <clears throat> being broad, but you can't understate what McCartney did, what he started to do. And if you listen to even the early stuff on, and I I, I always talk about the British albums. I don't refer to Beatles albums like Yesterday and Today because those are not those are compilations of what the British ones were. So on their first album, like Please Please Me. And, and through that and then through Hard Day's Night and, and Beatles for Sale, you see him progressing and you see him not only is his songwriting progressing, his bass playing is progressing, how he's thinking about the bass, how it's it's not a backing instrument and how it is used as a lead instrument with, with those guitar sensibilities. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing what he did and, and it, it did kind of bring – the bass player as someone who could be formidable and important. And you get people like John Entwistle, um, you know, Bill Wyman to a lesser extent that are not just there, but they're there to, to really enhance. So, mm -hmm. and maybe because he was such a formidable songwriter also that he was bringing that extra whammo to it. So, so he wasn't just like a Kelly Graucut where he was a hired bass player and you, and you kind of are in a bot, you're boxed in at that point. You know, you've only got so much latitude, the fact that he was writing, that he was kind of you know collaborating slash competing with John Lennon when they're in their growth, and and Lennon is trying to is is pushing the boundaries too. So I, I think you needed that also that collision of those two pushing each other and testing the boundaries of what they could do that you get a song like Rain, yep. which is from the it's not on Revolver but it's on the it was from the Revolver sessions That's and it right. was a single. Yeah. Listen to his work on that. I mean, that, that's a John Lennon song, but that is a bass-driven song, and it is just a, a song that really highlights what, what McCartney was doing, thinking about it melodically, not just kind of thumping along and, and playing. It. And, and you could make a case that the early stuff was like that, and he, has, he was just growing and progressing and expanding mm -hmm. at such an incredible rate that it, that it, it was mind boggling in the sixties. And he did set the blueprint for so many bass players that this can be a quote unquote lead instrument, yeah. you know, and then you, you go probably not even a year later to Penny Lane, which yeah, it's a, it's a poppy song, right? It's like, a, you know, oh, everyone knows Penny Lane, but listen to the bass work on that. I know song. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Most you know, of it's just, uh, yeah. Most of Re Re Revolver would be. But that's why. That's why Revolver is my favorite album by them because of, because of the bass. It's every you know you think of uh, 
I'm still sleeping. I love the bass on that. Even Eleanor Rigby has somewhat of a, you know, there's a you know, little bit of a bass line in that. And, Ta- you know, I mean, Taxman. Taxman. He, he's, and it's not just about the riffs because it's not like Paul McCartney is, is like a riff guy. Like he's known for that. But if but there are some iconics, right? Drive my car, yeah. day tripper. I mean, he's just using the the bass to in a way that at that point wasn't used like that. And that's the thing. Normally, you might hear that only as a guitar part or as a guitar riff, like ticket, uh, not ticket to ride to a lesser extent, but but day tripper and stuff like that. This what he was doing was using the bass in that place. So we go through he. We go into the 70s, and there's one song in particular that I want to point out, and only because it's so ironic, and it's usually what people people make fun of McCartney for. So in the 70s, he really got known as, as really kind of like, oh, he's being light, he's AM radio friendly, he's doing all pop songs, and great, you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. And I think the most ironic use of that in a song to sh- to really shove – I don't know if he did it on purpose, but to re- really shove it in people's faces <laughs> – is if you listen to the to the to the song "Silly Love Songs," which is the yeah. silliest thing ever, the bass work on that is incredible. It is absolutely a contradiction to what the song is saying and how people just say, "Oh, the silly love songs." What kind yeah. of thing is that? Go listen to the bass, and you'll hear what he's really doing, and you'll hear like a master at work, and he's fooling you into listening to this really throwaway pop song. And it is just the bass as a lead instrument, and you almost don't even realize it. Mm-hmm. He's not like like beating you over the head with it. It's so natural, his playing and his and his lines, and just the way he thinks about it in incorporating it in a song, you don't realize that that's it, it's a you're hearing a bass driven song. He's just absolutely amazing. We're not even talking about his his career of what he's done throughout his life and and with in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties and the resurgence he had now with his, his third, his third solo album. Mm -hmm. So prolific. Yes. Unstoppable. Absolutely. Best bass player. I'm, I'm putting it out there. Okay. I'm putting it out there. I'm, I'm putting all the, all the chips are going into the table with, with Paul McCartney as the best bass player. There are other ones that might be more, more better in theory, like Jaco Pastorius might be quicker, like Getty Lee, but when you boil all those things down into the the sensibility of writing accessible songs and using the bass in in that way as as a melodic thing or one of the first ones in rock to do it right a lot of people do it back then no one was doing it like that and every time the beatles came out with something somebody was trying to copy it if it was the stones if it was another band that was popping up dave clark 5 what have you they were just trying to imitate what he was what what he was doing. Yeah. They were just trying to keep up with it. So, mm-hmm. yes, did he, did he inspire others, and would others expand on that and maybe do more with it? Absolutely. But what he he was on the forefront back then of of what you could do with with an instrument that was largely relegated to behind the stage, standing next to the drummer in the shadows when you're on the Ed Sullivan show or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I you know that's. Like I said, I don't, I don't really, I don't go for favorites, but I rest my case, yeah, Your Honor. You do the, I, the prosecution I'm not gonna, rests. I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with you on this. I mean, because he, you know, he was or or is still is. Yeah. What do you, you mean know? was? This ain't a John Entwistle thing here. <laughs> you no, know, don't, you know, don't go there with it. Well, he's, he's 78, so he's my oldest, but okay. he's alive. Well, you go, Rip Van Winkle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, we did it. We, we did. It. We did our top fives. Now what we've got, and this is if this was like a DVD, this would be like the bonus features. Uh huh. Is I went ahead and I wrote down my five picks, and you wrote down your five picks. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you. And you're probably you probably how many did you get? I got four. You got four? I did. Oh my god! Wow. I'm so predictable. That's sad. <laughs> no, you're not. I just um, I know well, you're wait, wait, you got you got four out of five, and I'm not predictable. Well, what does that mean? I got. You want to know how many I got? How many did you get? Zero. Really? <laughs> yes. Not even end whistle. <laughs> no. 
Wow. So, so, why, so give, give me your list. Let's see. I mean, obviously, we know four of them. So I wonder what the fifth one was that you didn't Okay. Well, I, well, this I kind of threw out there. Um, you know, so, I didn't so really, I didn't really think you were, you were going to pick them, but it was somebody new, fairly new, and that was Bob Crawford from Ava Brothers. From Ava Brothers. Yes. Okay. So he was he was the one. So the four were, I'm going to guess, were Jocko, Carol Kay, Kelly Grockut, and Paul McCartney? That's right. Really? Carol Kay, Carol, Carol Kay, 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 I knew late to the list. No, well, I kind of, I kind of, right. I thought about it. I'm like, he's going to pick, you know, the Wrecking Crew because you know we know we talk about you know the Beach Boys and, and all that you know at, at length and and you know I I kind of if we're going to do a base on that I'm that's a guarantee that's going to be one of them, and I knew Jocko right. would be. Yep. So okay, so who there you didn't go. get any of mine, which didn't get any, and I, and I had one that I thought we would both have. Okay. I'm surprised so the, that you didn't even pick John Entwistle. Wow. Uh, no, but <laughs> so maybe you, maybe when you hear this list, you might change. Maybe. maybe. Maybe me giving you what I think you like will actually change you to say, you know what? This is actually what I do like. You, you, you <laughs> actually probably, do I'm not know me. Deny you, you, you'll, I, you'll, you will say, you actually do know me. I was wrong about myself. <laughs> I'm going to take your list and let's do another show. Oh, oh I don't know. Okay. I don't know so I, I think, I think this is what it's going to, I think this is what's going to happen. Okay. Well. So here's the one I thought we were, we were both going to have. I thought for sure McCartney was going to be on your list. I thought about it. I thought for sure. I was like, it's got to be like McCartney is going to be the, the, the common denominator. Everything else will be different. Mm -hmm. All right. You ready? Yeah. And this is in no particular order. Nathan East. Mm. No. Yeah, no. Dun, dun. He's great. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously Nathan East, Nathan East plays with, played with Clapton. Played Just with Clapton. Played know, with Nathan Joe East. Collins. He, um, yeah, he's 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 a session player. He's one of the one of the best session players, I guess, in, in the in the sort of funk. Okay. Style, but uh, but yeah, not not, not real. I mean, he just strike strike two. Okay, strike two. Right. So who else? Um, th this one I thought was going to be a. Um, like a nostalgia favorite. And I, I, I was like, yeah, he's, he's probably going to be on there. I, you know, he doesn't talk about him, but he's probably going to be on him. Sting. I came very close to picking Sting. Oh, come on, man. Stop playing. These are the ones no. you want. I know. No, this is your I, list. I, no, you, you, I, Sting was, <laughs> was most certainly probably before McCartney, believe it or okay. not. I was actually strongly thinking about Sting. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just absolutely love his bass playing. This this was the I'll I'll save the I'll save the the last minute replacement. I'll go to the next one. Uh O'Teal Burbage. Burbage. Or yeah, Timothy, I mean or Tim Fever. Would, I had them I had them slashed. That would have been a great a choice as well. And I, those I are uh, that's Tedeschi Trucks uh yeah. base, you know, the the two base the, players. The first base had. player they had. Right. Yeah. Um but yeah, I, I thought about that myself. Um Okay. So it's not like I don't but, but it's, Tal, not, it's not like Tal it's not like I don't know you. Right, it's well, not no, like I but, don't know you. But Tal Wilkenfeld is, you know, she, you know, like I, I mentioned him, and you know, when talking about her. Yes, and, I know, and that's why I thought I had you. I thought, <laughs> oh man, I got one. Okay, so then the number five that I switched out at the last second, and it didn't make a difference. It didn't change anything. The okay, I'll give you the original number five was Chris Squire. Yeah, I I was from I was yes. Bass player from yes. I was teetering with with him and and Getty Lee actually. Okay, all right. But ultimately, Getty Lee to me is the better player. Okay. Um. So er earlier today, I I went to the computer and I said I had like a an epiphany, like I said earlier, and I'm like, no, it's not Chris Squire, it's Roger Waters. No. Wow. No way. So this so so this is actually <laughs> numbers number six through ten. <laughs> is, is this list is six through ten, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Roger Waters, I, I wouldn't even. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I wouldn't even consider Roger really? Waters to be honest. I, I just I, I've seen him live. I've you know I know that's his primary instrument. But um, how long how long have we known each other? I I don't feel like I know you at all. <laughs> Who are you? I don't know. I'm sorry. What have you done with original Eric? That would be would be Paul McCartney, Nathan East, Sting, 
Roger Waters and Otiel Berber. Well, my, my thing that, is, that's is the like, Eric I, tend, I know. Well, th- th- that's what made this thing hard for me was because I over, like, like always, I overthink everything. So I'm thinking like, okay, I got a couple of players from the eighties. I don't want I, maybe I shouldn't pick Sting because that was oh, his time. So you were against Sting. I got So it. that's why Sting I chose was, Sting was caught up in decade, in decade was, mania or, or he didn't fit the age profile. You were no, going was, for, was, which was it? No, because I was talking about Peter Gabriel a lot and that, you know, the Sting and Peter Gabriel, it just, I don't know. It's yeah, just my crazy right. brain. I just, I just went out there a little bit. So all right, Sting, uh, Sting was kind of a, an early on my list. I was like, Sting, yeah. Sting was kind of in the in the running. I'm like, definitely right, a, a, an honorable mention. Let's put yeah. it. There. Let's put it. Yeah, there. I mean, I, if if, 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 I go, if if I didn't go so hard in on Nigel Harrison, probably Sting out of your list, Sting would have been on there. Mm-hmm. I think he would have. He, I think he deserves. I think he's like an honorable mention. He's he's definitely. Is Sting? I, you know, his his bass playing is. I think it's he's very underrated. You know, you don't really see him on a lot of, you know, lists and that kind yeah. of thing. But, you know, like, you know why? Because he also switched to guitar. Like after the, I mean, he still played the bass, but he really kind of switched to guitar and kind of really de-emphasized what he was doing with it in his solo career. It became more about the overall music yeah. and not about him. You know, he played the bass obviously, but it, it didn't become part of what he was doing it was it was an ingredient but not not the front it wasn't the icing it wasn't the first I thing i mean there there are some tracks i could think of especially on uh soul cages it was one of my it's probably my favorite solo album he put out um you know there's uh jeremiah a song called jeremiah blues and the bass line and that is just killer so if if i had to cite an example that would be one Horses work with the police. Every little thing you do, she does is magic. Is that you know just that that bass you know in the beginning of the boom that low that he just slides down. I love that. Um, but yeah, I mean he he definitely was in contention. But like I said, I, I overthought it and I just. So why don't we do why don't we do this? Let's put let's put Sting as our both of our honorary number six. I, I think we can both put Sting as like the he's the if one of these other guys drops out or something happens that makes me dishonor them. That's right. Sting Sting will fall will fall into this top five, but and he's just hanging out at number six, waiting outside the door. Something happens. I, I dis you know something happens, and I just decide to change up my list. Sting is like the guy that's in. Okay, he's he's the backup. If if one of these guys can't perform, he's like the understudy. There it is. Okay. Okay. All right. That's going to do it for this one. So wh- who are your favorite bass players? And and again, it doesn't have to be the best. As you see, these are what we picked are probably not the best. I'm sure you have what is your best and what is favorite to you. So we would love to hear your picks and why. So why not join the conversation? Join us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Thank you for listening. This has been the 3324 Podcast. This was our top five bass players with a bonus stinger in there. <laughs> We've been listening to 3324 Podcast with Dean and Eric, and we will see you on the flip side. Take care, guys.